Jesus is doing something new and radical with his church, and he wants us all to be part of it. The Lord has brought us salvation, and that is not simply a moment in history, it is a constant, ever-present reality. Teachers and parents tell us, pay attention. And there's something in that, because attention costs us something. We orientate our lives around the celebration of Easter, because it is a proclamation of our salvation. Hello and welcome back to this second episode of our Lenten season of Invited. I really hope you've had a fruitful week putting into practice some of the things that we reflected on last week. It is so important to keep on growing as Christians, growing in virtues, growing in holiness, and growing in love for the Lord. To help us in that goal of living out our baptismal vocation to the full, we have the support of our parish communities, which we must become an integral part of for our own salvation and for the good of our society. But our parishes face an ever-growing series of challenges in society today. However, we must not let that trouble us. Here at the Chapel of Our Lady, let us consider how Mary arose and went with haste when the Lord instructed her to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Mary had plenty of challenges to face as an expectant mother traveling such a long way, but she submitted humbly with goodness and with grace. And thanks to her yes, her desire to do the will of God, we were granted a savior. Sometimes it's not always easy to see God's will amidst everything that's happening. But we are joined today by a wonderful priest, Father Kieran, who is going to help us explore how we might face the certain challenges uh, that we are encountering every day, let's face them head on and bring about the kingdom of God in a new and exciting way. Father Kieran was ordained in 1987 and he's been a curate in West Byfleet, secretary to Bishop Cormac and he's also spent time in the English College in Rome. He's been a parish priest in Crawley, parish priest in Chichester and currently he's parish priest in East Brighton. Alongside that he's also the Episcopal Vicar for Formation, the Clergy Advisor for Safeguarding and a trustee of the diocese. Despite all that he still finds time for his hobbies which include cycling and skiing. So let's go over to him now and hear his vision for our church communities in the coming years. Next Sunday, we have the gospel story about Jesus clearing out the temple. There are people selling sheep and cattle and pigeons and the money changers are plying their trade. The reaction of Jesus probably disturbs us as it is angry, even violent, though not in a life-threatening way. It's not as though Jesus had stumbled across some random bizarre event in the temple. This was normal, and that was the point. The sheep, the cattle, and the pigeons were there to be purchased for sacrifices, and the money changers were there to convert cash into the required temple currency, no doubt with the Jonas commission. So Jesus did not see this as an isolated incident of inappropriate use of the temple. He really wanted to overthrow the whole system of cash for sacrifices, which would never be pleasing to God, and only served to perpetuate a corrupt system. He has come to bring about something radically new, so new and radical, that he doesn't mind creating a scene. What he has in mind is far too important to worry about what people might think about him at the time, or that we might be disturbed when we read about it even now. I would like for us to see this cleansing of the temple as something of a parable for our church today. A church which is in need of cleaning up and renewal. A church which is learning to move away from the confines of the temple and move towards becoming part of that body which was to rise up after three days. 
This new way of Jesus is the way which honours the past but changes the future. It is the way which has no time for the kind of sacrifices which mean nothing to God, but all the time in the world for that one perfect sacrifice of Jesus. In clearing out the temple, Jesus is preparing for something new. We can all be part of that new idea. I love the line from Psalm 95, which calls us to sing a new song to the Lord. Moving from the temple, which took 46 years to build, to the temple, which is the body of Christ, is a very new song. It was beyond the experience of those old style temple dwellers. Sometimes we might think it is beyond our experience, but it does not have to be. In fact, we are all called to be part of that same body through our baptism. Now, at the risk of showing my age and freely admitting that I probably don't get out very much, one of my favourite films of the 1980s was a film called Educating Rita. It's about a scouse hairdresser, played by Julie Walters, who wants to improve herself and her prospects. She embarks on an English degree and is tutored by a rather eccentric and alcoholic professor played by Michael Caine. It's very entertaining, if not a bit dated by now. There is one scene early in the story where Rita is in the pub with her mates on a Friday night, as they always did. As the evening rolls on, they all get more and more tipsy. And as usual, as the inhibitions are lowered, they all start to sing the same old songs as usual. The camera pans around the bar and everyone is singing apart from Rita, who has had enough. She refuses to sing and boldly states, I want to sing a new song. Meaning, of course, she actually wants a different kind of life. And so the adventure begins. You get the picture. In the clearing out of the temple, Jesus is making a statement. There is a new way. There is a better way. There is a new song to sing. That way and that song is him. Jesus wants to exchange the temple that will be destroyed for the temple that will be raised up. That is the temple of his body. And as baptised members of the church, we are all called to be part of that body. We are part of the body that is going to be raised up. This is the radical call to renewal in our communities. Those old songs, those old ways of doing things, do not always work for us anymore. Pope Francis was acutely aware of this. In his letter, Evangelii Gaudium, he invites us to dream with him. He writes, I dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse, capable of transforming everything, so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world, rather than for herself, preservation. That last line is a little bit stinging, but there are some parallels with the temple in Jerusalem here, with its pigeon sellers and money changers. It was preoccupied with keeping its own show going and maintaining the status quo. We can fall into that trap. If we don't see the bigger picture which Jesus is calling us to be part of. I'm sure that it was not by accident that our present Pope chose the name Francis. Saint Francis was a champion of renewal and regeneration of the church in his time. 
Although he lived some 800 years ago, there are some remarkable similarities and resonances between his age and ours. This was a time of great social upheaval, where the traditional dominance of the nobility was being threatened and undermined by the rising merchant and middle classes which Francis was part of. It was also a volatile time within the church, widespread corruption, the worldliness of the Crusades and abuse of power, all of that was rife. Against this background, Francis had the vision of Jesus speaking to him from the cross in the ruined chapel of the Portuncula, not far from Assisi. The voice spoke to him and said, go and rebuild my church, which as you can see, is falling into ruin. At first, Francis took these words quite literally and set about rebuilding the little chapel brick by brick. He later realised that Jesus was speaking of the wider church, the people of God, that which is meant to be his body. So Francis, in his humility and simplicity, embarked on that journey of renewal and purification. I think this is what prompted our Argentinian Pope to adopt his name. St Francis, who is a patron of Europe, is certainly an inspiration for us to keep rebuilding the church in the image of Christ and not of any other temple. Speaking personally, I think I came to the realisation that things had to change a few years ago, shortly after I had moved from Chichester to Brighton. I have to admit now that that was all a bit of a culture shock, moving from the provincial delights of Chichester to the in-your-face-anything-goes-right-on-Brighton. It took some getting used to. I have grown to embrace it all now. I think a defining moment came when one of the young families in the parish suggested that we could have um, a parish picnic on the level across the road from the church after Sunday Mass. The level is a park close to the church. I thought this was a great idea, so we started making tentative plans. And just a few days before the event, somebody very usefully pointed out to me that the location we had identified for the picnic was actually due to be the gathering point for the Brighton Naked Bike Ride on the very same day. Luckily, we were able to hastily make alternative plans, but welcome to Brighton. More seriously, during those early years, I came to realise that I actually needed to let go of many of my previous assumptions about how we do church. Perhaps this was partly due to do with the place, but also to do with where I was in my ministry and where the Holy Spirit was calling. So I had to let go of assumptions like, yes, people will come to Mass. But no, it seemed for the size of the parish, the attendance was very poor. People will approach the sacraments in the right order, thinking that, Baptism, First Communion, Confirmation and Marriage all happen in a nice, predictable sequence. That does not recognise the complexity and fragility of people's lives and faith journeys. Catholics, yes, will generally send their children to the local Catholic school. N no, not necessarily, especially if it's on the wrong side of town. And you have to walk past four other schools to get to it. This list could go on, but you get the idea. We needed to be doing church in a new way. It's a bit of a cliche now, but we needed to move from maintenance to mission. 
This is very much a journey we are still on in East Brighton. And it involves moving from a consumer model of church to a discipleship one. Jesus overthrew the stalls in the temple because they were there simply to serve the consumers, those who had reduced religious observance to something purely transactional. Certain stalls and structures in our own church may have to fall before we can move from the crumbling temple to being part of the risen body of Christ. We have probably become quite attached to some of those stalls which might need to be overturned, like a particular mass, in a particular time, in a particular place. We may have to get used to going to mass becoming a bit inconvenient, but wouldn't it be wonderful if having to make a bit more effort to celebrate the Eucharist in a different time or place made us realise that what is happening is so wonderful that it's worth being inconvenienced for. Moving to a discipleship model means that we come to appreciate that the Eucharist prepares us for mission. We become less attached to a particular temple and more attached to the body of Christ, which is rising with us as part of it, as part of him. All of the baptised are caught up in this movement whereby Jesus is leaving the old models of temple worship behind and bringing people into the new reality of rising with him. This is a new and exciting way of being church and it is almost as radical as that switch from temple worship to following Jesus, which is the movement described in the gospel. For some, it might mean the difference between going to church with a small c and being the church with a large c. If the church really is the body of Christ as we claim it is, then we will rise with him as well. This is the message of disciples on mission. Everyone is welcome and everyone has a gift to bring to this way of being church. I'll finish with a little story which for me has become a parable of inclusion and the need to be open to the possibility of being surprised by people's gifts. In one of my parishes, I used to accompany the year six residential trip to the Isle of Wight every year. It was like an annual rite of passage for that year group and generally great fun. One particular year, we had a young lad with us, we'll call him Jack, who was quite challenging. He was hyperactive. And we had to be very careful every morning to make sure that he had his medication for the day. Otherwise, we knew we would be in for a hard time. The trick was to get him to do this was to crush his tablets into powder and mix it with some marmalade, spread the marmalade onto his toast, and he took it for breakfast. It worked a treat. Each evening on the trip, we would walk the children down to the beach for a game of rounders or football and hopefully tire them out before bedtime. On this particular evening, as we walked past the pier, there was a group of Morris dancers performing. So we thought it'd be nice for the children to stop and watch for a while. Well, Jack was still full of energy by this time. So merely watching was never gonna be enough for him. So he launched himself right into the middle of this troupe of dancers and began to strut his stuff with some aplomb it has to be said but that wasn't the point i remember myself and the other teachers were totally embarrassed that he might be ruining this carefully 
choreographed performance, but we couldn't stop him. And it was about to get worse. The lady who seemed to be in charge then stopped the dance and everyone was still and the music fell silent. And we thought she was now going to complain to us on the staff to control the class. Instead, what she actually did was genius. She said, OK, then we will show you a dance you can all join in with. So she invited all the children to join the circle and taught everyone a simple dance that we could all be part of. Were it not for Jack's impulsive intrusion into the Morris dancers, no one else would have had that experience. He had done us all a favour and rather than tell him off, we had to congratulate him. Everyone is welcome to join the dance. And sometimes we can be surprised by the invitations we get. Jesus is doing something new and radical with his church and he wants us all to be part of it. He wants us not to be part of a temple which is decaying and will eventually collapse, but part of his body which is rising and on its way to glory. Thank you so much, Father Kieran, uh, for expressing that vision so well. I, for one, am excited by this opportunity to be a part of the church at this phenomenal time of renewal. And I thank God for each and every one of you taking part in this Lenten preparation. Because united, we can be the difference in society that we wish to see. We can proclaim the good news to all around us in our words, in our deeds and by our very presence. I encourage you now to reflect a bit more on what you've heard today. You can find the resources to help you with that on our website, abdiocese.org.uk forward slash invited. Next week, we're going to reflect on community a bit more, but in a much broader way. And we have an amazing guest speaker, and I can't wait for you to hear what he has to say. Have a blessed week. I'll see you then. Come to the Father, come one and all. Take up the call, His mercy can cover what's gone before, so come as you are.